Hi, welcome to the Cinematography Salon podcast, a show about celebrating cinematography and inspiring both the current and next generation of visual artists, exploring the latest trends, techniques, technologies, and culture, and featuring exclusive interviews with some of the most talented and innovative cinematographers working today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinematography Salon podcast. My name is Peter Pascucci, and we are thrilled and honored to welcome cinematographer Andre Cotillard to the show. Andre is a producer and cinematographer at Babylon 13 and the executive director of the Konoko Film Festival. This episode hits home for me because my grandparents were World War II refugees from Ukraine, and my mother is 100% Ukrainian. We decided to switch it up this week, and I am joined by my co-host David Kruta, who also has familial ties to Eastern Europe and has been following the war in Ukraine as well as Andre's work for a long time. Andre, for people who don't know, if you could start by introducing yourself and your role and what you do. Hello, my name is Andre. I'm Ukrainian cinematographer and producer. I'm part of Babylon 13 Collective. It's an independent film collective from Ukraine with a focus most on uh, documentary work, work and uh, covering uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, revolution of dignity since 2014. And I'm also executive director of Kinoko Film Festival. It's the first Ukrainian uh, film festival that's dedicated to the art of cinematography. It's a very young event. We had to have a fifth edition of festival last year, but it was postponed uh, due to Russian aggression. My previous work and latest work, Iron Butterflies, was screened this year at Sundance as a part of World Cinema Documentary Competition and at Berlinale as a part of Panorama. Iron Butterflies was my work as a cinematographer and producer. Andrei, I'm super thrilled to have you on the show. I've been following the war in Ukraine for a long time, and ever since Crimea was taken, it's just been something that's hit close to home for me. Having a family that's come out of communist Czechoslovakia, and we got to go, they got to get us out when I was a kid, and now seeing this kind of come full circle, it's almost like the past is repeating itself. We spoke a little earlier, and I wanted to get your take on what it was like growing up. You told me that you were born in 1994, I think you said. What was that like growing up in this post-Soviet environment, and how has it changed it yeah. with the recent events? When I grew up, it was a small city in the center of Ukraine. It's called Kremenchuk, infrastructure center, and of course, it wasn't hard in Ukrainian-Russian relationship. It was first year of Putin's presidency when they all looked like big democra- uh, democrats for all world and stuff like this. It was everything I had to say f- okay with Ukrainian culture and language. And it was, of course, still super much covered in a cultural level by Russian market in general, so Russian films, Russian songs, Russian pretty much everything in all aspects of our life, but it wasn't so clear for us why it's all happened. So it was like, okay, we are all under Soviet occupation or whatever Russian called these times. It became uh, harder and harder to live under this condition and the Ukrainians, we all have this need to represent our own our own culture, have an independent religion, church, and it's very clear scene that independent country can choose wherever a future the people needs. So after we had this breaking point moment in 2004, when uh, Viktor Yushchenko, the force of Ukrainian president, won the election 20 years ago almost, and he chose a Euro- European prosper and a way for the country. And so we start to prepare scenes for the integration. And after all, I realized that Russia had different plans. They will try to occupy our country eventually. And it's happened in 2014, in six years before the occupied part of Georgia. And world didn't take any reaction to this. In 2014, I was in the third year in the film school, studied cinematography, and Revolution of Dignity start. And they probably changed my whole life because before this, I have this idea to work just in a fiction, commercial music videos. I never matched myself with documentary, and I tried 
super hard in a film school to reach you know, this top level of commercial market and had some success. But uh, after all, I realized that revolution of dignity start. I saw how young people ready to fight for the freedom of their nation, basically, and inspired me on so many levels. I decided to join documentary and in general to start just photograph some things on the film, then make some very short pieces with our friends from director's department in the film school. Eventually, I was arrested during the Revolution of Dignity, sent to prison and charged for 15 years for so-called terrorism. But hopefully I spent just a few days in prison and one month something during home arrest or I don't know how it's called in English. And then the Revolution of Dignity won. I joined Babylon 13 a few weeks before Russia started the occupation of Crimea. And my life turned into documentary for, I don't know, 100%. So hours and hours, hundreds of hours in the pavilions to pre-light, learning how to use a camera movement with a dolly, fronts, and uh, all stuff that uh, should help me in the, on the stage with a music video or fiction projects in the series. So less experience in documentary field, but what's the power of Babylon 13? Because it's a big collective and I learned from the best ones, from the best DPs, from the best directors. They were like 20 years older than me with a very nice experience already in all these fields. So it was very fast film school for me, but in three or four months, I think I grow up as a documentary DP, uh, as a documentary cinematographer. I start to realize how to mix things, how to bring my understanding of composition from fiction films to documentary, how to make it m more beautiful. I don't know if beautiful is correct explanation, how to work with observation. Okay, observation, it's uh, three or four years after 2014. It's how I grow up. I grow, I try to learn how to observe documentary life, not penetrate anything with my camera and how to help directors to tell a story, basically, without penetrating reality and mixing it. The work is so beautiful. I, I was really inspired listening to the, the camera image panel where you and some, some collaborators talked about how cinematography has become more than just an art form for you, how it's become an act of resilience and, and in many ways a weapon against against what's going on. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about, yeah, about that shift to documentary and how you view cinematography in the context of the invasion and, and of the war and maybe how you've seen some of the images that you and some of your peers have created and how it's had an impact on a wider audience. I, I'm just trying to mix fiction and documentary re reality in my work. So when I work with the fiction scenes, like it was in Iron Butterflies, I tried to bring more my experience from documentary film about light, about how I, how I feel the camera movement or how I, I don't know, feel the composition or everything that dedicated to image. Because in documentary, we have this pure naturalism reality that we can use in a fiction form of narration of visual storytelling and the same way, uh, way in is in fiction because making it not so beautiful, n not so clear is a very open and honest way for me. So when I was in a film school, we were a little bit stubborn and tried to work just with the best camera, with the best lenses. And I don't know if maybe you guys have the own dream. I dreamed to work with 18K uh, light, like for for a beautiful big setup and I did a huge set setup for my graduation film. It was filmed on Kodak Vision 3, and, uh, RFX 4C5, big setup, stuff like this. And, but it, it was a level when I tried to work with the big things, like, because it's cool. But in the end, in Iron Butterflies, I used four different cameras and nine different lens setups. And right now I am super open to not go just in a very strict way. Let's go, let's rent 
Alexa 35 and what do you have with our like cook S7i all 11 lands please DIT all big fancy things so now I'm super more flexible and gear is important but what what's more important for me is readiness openness to change things but just having a lot of tools that doesn't necessarily mean you're telling the right story for sure for sure i'm much more spending time right now with a script with a director to understand their beliefs and what they want from a final result than i spent uh, with a pre-light or te- 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 so i'm now also for Iron Butterflies, we made dozens of pre scenes, like testing an equipment, the camera movement, everything. But with a much more deeper understanding of what we need as a result. Absolutely. You have mentioned Iron Butterflies a couple of times. Could you tell our listeners uh, about the film and what it is? It's a story about a MH17 flight, Russian soldiers shut down a passenger plane. There was 298 people on board. It was a plane from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And it was shut down by the Russian rocket from Buk missile system. For years, Russia tried to spread a lot of propaganda about this case. But eventually, a trial was set up in Amsterdam. And it's just in the last year, and few people was like not sent to prison because they are in Russia. They are guilty. Yeah, this is a hybrid film that consists a lot of different materials. So our own documentary material from open source, fictional recreation episodes, animation. So a lot of different parts. The film was a big hit. I like Sundance, Berlinale, movies that matter, Carlo Vivari. I don't know, we'll have a premiere in Korea, in Australia, in, I don't know, dozens of EU countries. So a big festival history, and now it's in the uh, cinema theaters in Ukraine. What was it like? Like you mentioned, you started off not in documentary, and then it was almost like you're pushed into this role of, of being a documentarian, and then to have the reception of Iron Butterflies be so huge. What was it like to find out that it was in Sundance and, and in Berlin? And what do you think that says about the project? Can you tell us a little bit about your reaction to the reception? It's just... When you spend four years of your life with a film and you receive one email from Sundance programmer, Andri, congratulations, you will be a part of World Cinema Documentary Competition. You feel pretty much nothing for a few hours. Yeah, just was super happy to trick our producers because we asked two times, have you been in the United States before? Uh, maybe guys, uh, for some refresh, we have to go to ski resort stuff like this and uh, they ask like why we have to go to the ski resort like we are in ukraine and yeah right in the end uh, i spoil everything and uh, we are super happy that our work uh, will be it's a big venue and reach a lot of people absolutely so we actually we first met at sundance how was your experience there it, it was a big journey for me at a pre- and my producer's debut so it's super hard to mix the scenes i don't do mix cinematography and produce it's super hard now i'm trying to separate producer's work from cinematographer's work because it's just it's just crazy to deal with both tasks but in the end with iron butterflies we had a beautiful co-production partner from Munich, Trimacel. They are just super nice people who help us to finish a film. They are not just a beautiful and very clear partner, but a big friend for us. One understood everything about this film and they were a truly partners. So I am believe in co-production right now really much. It was my first time in the United States. So pretty much everything new, big cars. High prices. Like first screening was a bit hard for us because it was a lot of journalists and Americans. I think European guys in Europe watch a movie with a bit, a little bit another tone. 
I have to say, without popcorn and Coca-Cola, especially if you're, it's even forbidden in most of festival, big festival venue, like I'm selling popcorn in a, in a venue. So it was uh, quite an experience for me for a first screening. What impressed me is that the age of uh, audience. So in Europe, it's much more younger audience, like teenager, university students, stuff like this. Most of the Sundance screening, especially second, third, fourth, uh, fifth, people who attend were like people in the retirement age. And it was super interesting conversation with them because it's artistic hybrid format, uh, not the usual type of documentary, not the Netflix documentary, yes, or whatever, VOD documentary. I have one beautiful memory from the, the screening at Salt Lake City. Uh, one man, like 60 plus age, ra raised a hand during Q&A and said, guys, I'm uh, usually buy a ticket blindly without reading an explanation or synopsis. And he said, my first thought that it will be a film about Iron Butterfly, my lovely rock band from 60s. Uh, first impression was un unexpected. He said actually very beautiful thing that he never felt so close to Russian-Ukrainian war than after watching Iron Butterflies. Because Ukraine, of course, covered by a media in uh, US from very different perspective, I can imagine. But TV news is just a TV news. It's a few minutes between uh, weather news and sport news. It's the power of documentary filmmaking and filmmaking in general, that you can engage emotionally people in your story. Well, it's m much deeper because you have 90 minutes or more, more or less, a lot of minutes to tell uh, the story. And it was uh, super memorable for me. Wow. Zooming out of that project for a second, I'm personally curious what sort of the current state of the cinematography industry or the film industry in Ukraine is. The sense that I've gotten is that for a lot of you, it's taken a pivot into this work like Iron Butterflies. But could you just tell us for people who don't know what the film industry looked like there prior to 2022 and how it's changed since for you and for anyone else you know who's in the industry? Actually, before Full Scale Invasion, we had a super uprising industry in Ukraine. I would say healthy industry with a lot of interest in women. So a lot of interest didn't start like union talks, a few new festivals. And uh, Ukraine was a big field for commercial shooting, especially like we had uh, dozens of uh, commercial production, like radioactive, most of commercial for BMW, Jameson, Apple, everything was shot here. Our streets, we had as an industry, it was a few nice collaboration with HBO and Netflix. We start to have a conversation that these big companies will open the offices in Ukraine and increase the TV series level in general. So it was a very interesting time uh, for us. It was a bit hard sometimes with government to engage them in uh, not into films for white audience, comedy and stuff like this, but engage that we have to talk to go with cultural diplomacy and concentrate on uh, films with uh, international potential more. But it was like a conversation, what we have to film, films for domestic audience or films that represent Ukrainian culture abroad. But in general, it was a good move. So without a war in a few years, I would say we will have, I don't know, twice more venues where the cinema theaters things. And what I heard from Ukraine, so I run a festival all dedicated to the art of cinematography, Kinoko, as you mentioned, and I worked with rental houses because this is our most partners. And what I heard in 2021 is that uh, biggest rental by 50 more Alexa. So it's a very healthy scene when commercial market and the private businesses think about big credit for years to buy just an equipment, uh, to set up a few uh, big gra grading rooms. So it was pretty much okay, I would say. Yeah, and so, I mean, how has it shifted and where do you see the priorities now in, in the industry and what's the current state of affairs? Like when the full-scale invasion started, some people decided to join an army. Our most talented uh, cinematographers, Sergei Mikhunchuk and Yaroslav Polunsky, 
they are like elephant of industry. They work, studied in university, and they joined an army, and they uh, serve an army till this day. Most of my old crew, my gang from the past, joined an army as well. My gaffer, my first DC, my key grip. Dolly guys, so all my crew right now in army and I'm trying to support their work as uh, soldiers right now. I had experience and Babylon 13 was, I know, one of the most renowned film collective production with a huge expertise in documentary field. So we are in more or less okay position. We have some international project. I don't know. So we are in a super, we are not in a super fancy since but we have money to live yeah some colleagues especially from a fiction field from advertising they just shift their field of work some right now i don't know it's a super sad i uh, i met uh, gaffer with whom i worked in a commercial he said like for in 2022 five or six shooting days per year before full-scale invasion these guys could work like 22 days per month is a very nice high prices like salary uh, and I don't know they some people switch to documentary field sometimes it's it's good switch sometimes I just saw that people they are still learning because working for years dozens of years in a ketchup commercial and now you have to forgot about that you have a five nine, ten people, crew with you, focus puller, five electricians, cover, and the cameraman. And you have to forget about it and just take a camera, gear, bulletproof vest, and go to, to the front line. It's not an easy task for all. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned that you've been traveling around a bit doing these documentaries and trying to tell these different stories. Could you speak at all to what it's like shooting documentaries on the front lines? Well, it's depend on what kind of documentary. I'm right now. I'm in the middle of this cinematographers and producers work. So I spent unfortunately some time in the office, just trying to uh, fundraise more money to uh, to run out to run the projects, stuff like this. I'm okay to work. I'm okay to work the story. I have different tools for different tasks. I like to help foreigners to cover a work. So I'm super happy when director from Sweden, for example, asked me to film something for them. It's just good deal for me because it's, it's about money sometimes as well because it's higher rate, but it's also a way because I'm Ukrainian and I felt I can help them to understand the essence of the story. Even uh, sometimes to be translator for them, because it's not that you can go with a translator to the red zone in the front line, or even not a red zone in the front line to Kharkiv, for example. And just try to uh, to show them how beautiful our country is and how Russian aggression trying to destroy pretty much everything. On that topic, I think the media coverage of the war both in the States and, and abroad. I'm just curious your perspective on that and, and whether you think what you, yeah, what you see is accurate and what maybe you would like to see change about the way that things are being covered. There was a huge massacre in Bucha. More than hundreds of people were killed under occupation. And it was a lot of media. So Bucha is sub suburb of Kiev. It's 25 minutes by car from this office. Maybe 35 minutes, okay. So when it was uh, deoccupied, dozens of media were able to cover these war crimes. But dead bodies just in streets, hundreds of them, mass gravings. And the scene is that it was so covered by dozens and dozens of reporters helped our country to, to defend, to debunk all Russian fakes, because it was like Russia said, it was all staged. It was like Hollywood director, Hollywood production designer invited to stage it. And it, it's unbelievable, yeah? But this is a reality where, where we live. And all this TV news, so it's impossible to stage it. 
it's just impossible to stage it for hundreds of reporters. And it was like super hard truths that were delivered right into uh, the countries. And the president of United States, of Canada, of France and Germany, they all had to comment it somehow to react. And for the first time after full-scale invasion, I realized the power of media, how it can help truly to open some eyes and to say like, it's, it's freaking unbelievable. Here's the people we were killed just because they wore Ukrainian ribbon and that's all. And all of these things, I, I helped to record an interview for some colleagues with, uh, it was a granny, like 72 year old women who were raped by three Russian soldiers, young, younger one, like our age or younger. And like, she was ready to talk. And it was like, I asked her like in Ukrainian, you are sure that you are, you will be able to tell the story and it will be like publicly on air. And she said like, yeah, because my, yeah, it was the scariest moment of my life because my, my grandson watched how they did it. And what I can do as a Ukrainian, as a DP to tell the story to local fixers, to bring directors and reporters from all big media and said like, okay, guys, uh, record interview with this woman. I'll invite your translator just to not looks like that I am mistranslate anything for you. Just it your guys to your crew. Here's a lady that ready to speak. And that's something that we can, I, I think media industry can do even better to focus on Russian war crimes because there is money. And especially that's trigger me most is war crimes in the field of sexual raping or how it's say in English, not just in a, with women, but mostly with a man, something that Russian love to do often and kidnapping of children because Russia kidnapped hundreds of Ukrainian children from most of them are orphans. So they just kidnap our children and we have to, I'm ask all my colleagues here in Kiev who are working for international media to uh, covering it more precise and more close because it's a uh, horrible sense. So, you know, I, in your camera image speech, you, you talked about seeing, and I, I imagine it's from Bucha that you were referring to, but you said something that resonated with you was seeing a father send his family to Poland. Um, could you maybe expand on that a little bit and how some of these images affect you and how you might work them into your work to help tell these stories? I, I can talk briefly about Kamarimash because I'm super thankful for the team in general, because that event that you refer to, it was possible just with the help of Kamarimash. We brought like eight Ukrainian, seven Ukrainian GPs, very much different approach, art artistic approach, and they're very different visual storyteller. And Anton Yeremchuk, who uh, filmed this part in Bucha, we started in the same university. I'm just one year older in the film school than, than he was. And I was shocked how the all very different perspective into the war from my colleagues matched and how the same things triggered us. Things with the rape people and with the abuses and the kidnapping of children. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll we'll put that down in the show notes because I'd love for people to see that, and I I really enjoyed watching all of you speak there, and and I'm really thankful that Camera Maj went out with that kind of support. I think it, it's something that the organizations that we work with should be doing, as opposed to just trying to entertain people. Like these are important stories that need to get out there, and and the fact that they have a cinematography angle is you know it's something that that brings an additional perspective to the various films that we watched kind of expanding on that with that panel and a little bit of what you talked about with you know your fundraising and and trying to bring other people in i think you mentioned that you have a little bit of difficulty bringing in fundraising and bringing in help what is that like and what what are those difficulties like and how would you like to change that it wasn't a question for us for last year either run or not Kinoko in Kyiv because we all decided not to go in 2022. Now we have uh, talks internally in the team about possibility to have a small edition of a film festival because we still have a lot of film to show that have a very interesting visual storytelling, interesting cinematography work. 
both in fiction and documentary field. And now I have a little bit hope that I'm somehow can find the resource to uh, run the festival. It's long story short, it's a, not so big money. We are talking about like $100,000, but it's still pretty much impossible to find this money in Ukraine because most of the money in the field of culture and cultural event gone to army needs. And we are not questioning this choice because first we have to win the war. And second, a Ukrainian government for sure will help Ukrainian film festivals to, to go and to uprise after the war. But right now, as I said, guys asked me about Kinoka because uh, students uh, are in love with our festival because we have uh, special places for the films, not just for a big one, but for the etudes as well. And we will have a very small edition of it in Kiev maybe with underground screening in a shelter or in metro stations. But we will, it will be more activism. But we have to show the world that we are alive because we are alive. We are not in a depressed mood that uh, all bad uh, rocket attack. Yeah, of course, like horrible. In May, we had 22 rocket attacks per month. I'm in Kiev. Everyone was like sleepy kitty because spending a night in a metro station, it's not a five-star hotel, I have to say. But yeah, if someone, some company will be allowed to help, I'm more than happy to talk and to describe our needs and engage them. Because after uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine win, we will be for sure you know, have this super big push of a prize, you know, everything in Ukraine and the festival as well. I'm believer somehow. And what we are trying to do in Ukraine is to build something like this in Ukraine, more about community and how we can level up our film school education level and all the things. If someone able to help, I am open to talk. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, hearing you talk about it, it's very inspiring, the the hope that remains. And I think for me, family members from Ukraine, my grandmother and everything, like I, I've always had a pretty clear understanding of the spirit of Ukraine and what it means to be Ukrainian. And I just, I think like now with all the attention on it, I think the world is starting to see like how strong and resilient and, and hopeful and powerful like Ukrainians are. And so I'd like to just hear from you a little bit about maybe, yeah, what you can share about the Ukrainian spirit and how you've seen that in the context of what's going on and just share a little bit about that. I can, <laughs> I uh, for hours can talk about Ukrainian spirit of resistance and freedom. I don't know. I saw so many examples of Ukrainian bravery. Ukrainians love freedom in general, freedom of uh, everything, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of being able to uh, fuck Russia. What we have to do is win the war and secure dozens of years of normal, peaceful life for our children, for the next generation. We need peaceful future and we will fight for our home. My father is a 53 year old and a few days ago he was called to serve an army. Most of his life he spent as a commercial photographer and a musician in a, in a band of Ukrainian uh, choir. So you can imagine that my father, he's not a Nazi, <laughs> how the Russia tried to represent Ukrainian men. He's just a regular person in a regular city who playing some musical instrument in a national choir. And then he will be served for his country in the front line. It wasn't a question for him either go to a recruit center or not. He just went there. And I asked, you know, at your age, maybe it's you can go to the doctor and show your problem with the heart and problem with an eye. And he said, like, you're just kidding because I, I, I will do my best to learn uh, how to operate a rifle. And it, it's for me for about Ukrainian period of freedom. Because if our people in this age decided to fight for the freedom, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's inspiring watching the bravery and the courage of your people standing up against the Russian aggression. And at the same time, it, it's incredibly sad to see people that grew up peaceful that do things like 
bring art into the world to try and make people's lives better that they have to go and participate in violence and possibly not come back and the idea that you know your country is losing an entire generation or not an entire generation but there's a lot of people that are unnecessarily being lost and I think what you're doing with these movies and by continuing to work on creating projects that get the culture out there that that show who you actually are. I mean, it's it, it's absolutely amazing to me. So yeah, this has been just such an amazing conversation. And we're both so grateful for your time and, and for you to come on the show. You know, a big part of this is just giving you the stage to be able to express anything you want to the wider community. And I think David and I are both really excited for the community that we're a part of to see your work and how beautiful it is and all of the efforts that, that you have going on. And so just kind of wanted to open it up to you to, to say anything about what's currently going on and, and anything that people can do to get involved. What I'm thinking about is that it's super sad that I'm a cinematographer and have a need to talk with you guys about political scenes, not about cameras, lenses. And I would I would love to talk about why I choose this lens in Iron Butterflies or this cameras or this Another on how I color graded this film remotely with Nicholas Coleman, beautiful grader from Munich. It's just uh, it would be super interesting and inspiring for me to share these things. But unfortunately, uh, I guess my role is on how I color graded this film remotely with Nicholas Coleman, beautiful grader from Munich. It's just it would be super interesting and inspiring for me to share these things, but unfortunately, I guess my role is to to trigger some thoughts and to highlight our common big problems bigger than choosing a lens. I would be very happy if we will have this conversation again in a few years after Ukrainian victory, and it will be just about uh, cinematographer tools and visual language. We would love that, honestly. The nice thing about us running the show is that anything's possible. So we could even do a part two of this episode where we dig into the, the technical on iron butterflies and, and really nerd out on, on camera stuff. Yeah, I think that's a great point. For me, I think what's important and what we're trying to achieve with this podcast and to a greater extent with the whole group is to get beyond just the technical stuff, to get into the feelings behind why you do something, the struggles that are involved. And this is just happens to be very specific to you know your situation and what's going on in ukraine i'd absolutely love to have you back once you guys win let's have you back and let's nerd out on the lenses and i will leave this off i think a nice place to wrap this up could be you know you mentioned that russia is trying to steal the joy of the ukrainians have they stolen the joy no no shit. we are uh, super much alive and i don't know we have a new cruise for tomorrow they will go and film and we will have a few young cinematographers join Babylon 13 this month. They just graduated from film school and we will try to share our experience and engage them to work with us. Yeah, everything okay, okay here, as I can say so. We are ready to fight back in cultural level, in the military level, in all level. I'm super happy to be in Kiev, not in other cities or countries. Super right place to be. Wow. Yeah. The bravery is is really inspiring. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing everything. And yeah, we really look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you, Andri. Thanks. It's been amazing. Like very powerful words. We hope we can get this out and get some more visibility on this. Thank you so much. This episode of the Cinematography Salon podcast was produced by Peter Pascucci, Oren Sofer, and David Kruta, with original music by One Wave. We created this episode in partnership with the Cinematography Salon, and we would like to extend a special thanks to the Salon community for sourcing topics for this episode. If you enjoyed listening to the episode, we encourage you to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes and news. Thanks. Thanks.